Hey everyone, welcome to another installment of Harry Potter Theory. Today we're going to be diving into the lives of the fabled trio, Harry Potter, Hermione Granger, and Ron Weasley, after the events of the final book, Harry Potter and the Deathly Hallows. After the dust settled and the battle with Voldemort came to an end, the Wizarding World celebrated the triumph of good over evil. Voldemort's downfall had a profound impact on the Wizarding World, effectively bringing an end to a dark era characterized by the absence of hope and replacing it with a renewed sense of optimism. However, it also marked the beginning of an uncharted chapter in Wizarding World history, and because the books and films ended, we never really got many insights into how the Wizarding World rebuilt itself, and more specific to today's topic, we weren't given any further information on what the lives of our beloved trio looked like in the aftermath of the war. We were given a brief epilogue that gave us a glimpse into their lives 19 years after the Battle of Hogwarts, but besides that, nothing else. All we get to see are the main characters gathered at Platform 9 and 3 quarters as they see off their own children to Hogwarts. But this leaves a pretty large gap in time, 19 years to be exact, that's relatively uncharted. Today I'd like to provide you with some information on what transpired with the trio during these relatively unexplored two decades following the war. From their personal to their professional lives, this video is going to cover it all. Let's get into it, starting with Hermione Granger. It may not surprise you to hear that the first thing Hermione did after the Battle of Hogwarts was find her parents. If you don't remember, Hermione had to make a difficult choice during the war with Voldemort, in which she wiped their memories and convinced her parents to relocate to Australia. I've also modified my parents' memories so that they're convinced they're really called Wendell and Monica Wilkins, and that their life's ambition is to move to Australia, which they have now done. That's to make it more difficult for Voldemort to track them down and interrogate them about me or you, because unfortunately, I've told them quite a bit about you. Hermione's actions prompted the new couple, deemed Monica and Wendell Wilkins, to act on their ambition to move, packing up their belongings and heading straight for Australia. Of course it was all with the goal of protecting them, but it was a somber moment for sure. Fortunately, with Voldemort out of the way, this gave her an opportunity to track them down and restore the memories that she had previously wiped, effectively bringing her parents back. After this, she made arrangements to go straight back to Hogwarts. Shortly after Voldemort had been defeated, the reconstruction of Hogwarts began. With the combined effort of dedicated wizards and the support of the wizarding community, this restoration project revived Hogwarts as the prestigious school of magic it once was, ready to welcome new generations of students in a relatively short period of time. Minerva McGonagall oversaw the project and later reprised her role as full-time headmistress. Because Harry, Ron, and Hermione had been off Horcrux hunting and taking down the most infamous dark wizard of all time, they invariably missed a pretty good portion of school. This meant that they had a big gap in their seventh year education. And while it is not explicitly mentioned in the books or films if Hermione returned to Hogwarts for her seventh year, J.K. Rowling later revealed that yes, Hermione did go back. And this can't be too surprising given Hermione's dedication to her studies and her belief in the importance of education. She ended up going back to the school for one final year in order to complete her newts. After this, she began her post-Hogwarts career at the Department for the Regulation and Control of Magical Creatures where she was able to help improve the lives of house elves and the like. After some time in the position, she eventually moved to the Department of Magical Law Enforcement, where she was instrumental in helping to abolish pro-pureblood laws. Oh yeah, and during all of this, Hermione and Ron Weasley became a proper item, going on to get married and have two children. Throughout the series, subtle hints of their affection for one another can be noticed, and their relationship continued to develop as they supported each other during the darkest times. But more on that when we get to Ron. Hermione also later took on the task of translating the Tales of Beetle the Bard from its original text, which had been written in runes. The book was bequeathed to her in Albus Dumbledore's will in 1997. Demonstrating her linguistic abilities, Hermione completed the translation, which was subsequently published in 2008. Notably, the book also featured insightful notes on each tale, penned by Dumbledore before his demise. These invaluable notes were graciously lent to Hermione by her former professor and headmistress of Hogwarts, Minerva McGonagall. And as if Hermione hadn't done enough already in her post-Hogwarts years, it's been expressed that in 2019, she even became Minister for Magic. 
What can I say? My parents were dentists. I was bound to rebel at some point. Forty is leaving it a little late, but you've just done a brilliant thing. You were certainly not being told off. I just need to look at your paperwork every now and again. That's all. Consider this a gentle nudge from the Minister for Magic. Hermione's life post Deathly Hallows certainly wasn't short of excitement. Harry Potter. After Voldemort's defeat, Harry did not return to Hogwarts like Hermione. Instead, he decided to dive straight into his magical career. In the books, Harry previously expressed his ambitions to become an Aura, aka Dark Wizard Catcher, and drawn by the excitement and significance of a profession that includes skilled witches and wizards like Mad-Eye Moody, Kingsley Shacklebolt, and Nymphadora Tonks. And following the Second Wizarding War's conclusion, Harry was offered a position as an Aura at the Ministry of Magic by the newly appointed Minister for Magic, Kingsley Shacklebolt. Kingsley uniquely allowed those who had fought in the Battle of Hogwarts to bypass Newt requirements for the Aura position. This meant that Harry did not have to go back to Hogwarts and complete any further education. Upon becoming an Aura, Harry was recognized as a skilled authority, contributing to the transformation and modernization of the Aura department and the Ministry as a whole. Alongside Hermione Granger, who at that time had attained a senior position within the Department of Magical Law Enforcement, they played key roles in this reform. By 2007, at the tender age of just 26 or 27, Harry was appointed as the head of the Aura Office. Throughout the years, Harry would also often return to Hogwarts and give Defense Against the Dark Arts lectures at the request of Headmistress Minerva McGonagall. And it was during these visits that he ensured Severus Snape's portrait remained on the wall in the Headmaster's office. It's safe to say that Harry went on to achieve quite a lot, but in my opinion, his professional success was overshadowed only by his personal success. Unsurprisingly, Harry went on to marry Ron's sister, Ginny Weasley. We know this because it's featured in the epilogue. However, we're never really given much info on their three children. James Sirius Potter was Harry and Ginny's firstborn child. Although we're not quite sure about when he was born, all records indicate that his birth date falls between the summer of 2003 and the fall of the following year. As you've probably noticed, James Sirius Potter was born with quite a powerful name. His first name was taken from his paternal grandfather, James Potter, and his middle name, Sirius, was taken from Harry's godfather, Sirius Black III. Albus Severus Potter was the second child from Harry and Ginny's relationship. Albus was born only two years after his older brother, James. He was named after one of the most powerful wizards in the world, Albus Dumbledore, and one of the most important spies of the Second Wizarding War, Severus Snape. Lily Luna Potter was the third and final child from Harry and Ginny's marriage. She was also their only daughter, which must have been a relief after the headaches the two parents received from Albus and James's roughhousing childhood. Lily was born two years after Albus, which meant she was four years younger than James, the oldest Potter child. As you might have guessed, Lily was also named after many of the most important people in Harry's life. Her first name was taken from Harry's mother, Lily, whose deep magic was responsible for both of Voldemort's deaths and her middle name, Luna, was in honor of Luna Lovegood. It's also been revealed that in addition to raising his own kids, Harry spent a considerable amount of time with Teddy Lupin, the orphaned son of Remus and Tonks. Teddy was officially raised by his grandmother, but Harry helped whenever he could. The last thing to add to Harry's resume came in 2020, when he became head of the Department of Magical Law Enforcement at the Ministry of Magic, a highly prestigious position that most other departments answered to and was responsible for upholding magical law. Well done, Harry. Ron Weasley. Like Harry, Ron never returned to Hogwarts. Instead, he took up Kingsley Shacklebolt on his offer to become an Aura. Harry and Ron utterly revolutionized the Aura department at the Ministry of Magic. Rowling also emphasized that by joining the Ministry, Harry and Ron helped turn it into a really good place to be. They made a new world, Rowling said. In this role, Harry and Ron tracked down and captured the remainder of Voldemort's supporters. However, he didn't remain in the role for very long, as just two years after becoming an Aura, he left the position to help his brother George out at Weasley's Wizard Weezers in Diagon Alley. This is revealed in a quote from Rowling. I don't think that George would ever get over losing Fred, which makes me feel so sad. However, he names his first child and son Fred, and he goes on to have a very successful career, helped by good old Ron. Ron joined George at Weasley's Wizarding Weezers, which became an enormous money spinner. But besides all of his professional success, Ron also found personal success when he married his longtime childhood crush, Hermione Granger. We're given glimpses of this in the epilogue, 
where Ron is shown sending his children off to Hogwarts at Platform 9 and 3 quarters, alongside his new wife Hermione. The pair ended up having two children in total, Rose and Hugo Granger Weasley. In the epilogue, we see Ron and Hermione sending Rose off to Hogwarts, along with Harry's son, Albus. It has also been expressed that despite Ron's terrible driving track record, he did eventually obtain a muggle driving license, even if he had to place a confundus charm or two on the driving instructor to get it. In the end, Ron ended up living a pretty good life, working alongside his brother, and married to his childhood sweetheart. And a nice bonus for all three members of the trio was that they were immortalized on chocolate frog cards, cementing their legacies and accolades in wizarding history. And that's it for this video. Did you ever wonder what happened to the fabled trio after the Battle of Hogwarts? Hopefully this gives you a little bit more closure with regards to their characters. Until next time, remember, it does not do to dwell on dreams and forget to live.